we have sent forward this command. Let us, in faith believing, believe that he is at work in each one of these lives. And it's not only physical healing, but spiritual healing that's necessary. Last week we talked about sin. Remember the title? Probably not. But it was to be born again is not to sin. This morning, I'd like us to think about to be born again is to love one another or the brethren. I should be over there, but I'm not. Uh, I feel sort of lopsided. And all you folk over on this side is so far away from over there. So I thought I'd just choose the middle to uh, walk back and forth. Is that all right with you? I like to move a little bit when I speak. As I said, last week we discussed about sin. To be born again is not sin. I'd like to do a brief summary of that if I could. The Bible tells us that we do not ever need to sin once we are born again. John writes that sin is rebellion, fighting against, a willful decision. The willful was added by John Wesley. But John the Apostle says to rebel against God is absolute sin. And he gives us an example, Adam and Eve, who were kicked out of the garden, thrown out of the garden, because they had willfully sinned against their Creator. And we've suggested how errors, mistakes, and poor judgments to God and to man around us, our fellow, fellow friends and brother, we hurt each other's feelings. Or if we have hurt someone deeply, even someone we don't know, God will forgive us and our seed that he has planted in as a born-again person will continue to grow as we repent. Say, I'm sorry. We talked how I am sorry are the three most difficult words in the English language. So when we receive repentance for our errors and mistakes, the sin see inside us continues to grow and to grow, and as such doesn't separate us from God. But sin, as a direct rebellion against God, where we make the decision, I'm going to do it my way regardless of what I know about God's law, when we reach that point, that is a time when we are separated from God And our seed, that inner seed, will die without the grace and mercy of our Father, who, from whom we seek repentance. We also learned a very important thing, or talked about it last week, that being born again, committing ourselves fully to Christ, are not, they are only part of a lifelong growing part process. They enable the pro us to grow, but uh, we don't get born again, pull out a chair, and sit down, and watch the world go by. We continually to do what he has instructed us to do, and that is to reach out to others, and show them and live before them as a little Jesus in this world. It's a growing, growing thing. I've often wondered, as I've looked at myself, sometimes we talk about the New Year's resolutions. You know, have you heard of those? That's where, when the New Year comes in, and we say, this year, I'm going to stop drinking coffee, or even more serious kinds of things. But I don't know about your life, but uh, somehow or 
our New Year's resolutions probably only last during the weekend when we make them. But our resolution to Jesus Christ our Lord is a lifelong process. And if that is the case, I would suggest that as Christians, this for the new year, let's look at how Christ has blessed us in the past year. And look and see how we have grown from last year to this year. Look to see the miracle working, the hand of God in your life and mine. God wants all of us. And as we give to him, he makes our road pleasant. Peter Scott and I were talking. We talk sometimes. And he reminded me of an old preaching example of using the relationship between a man and a woman to describe the process and point of full commitment with God. Now, admittedly, the best example is probably poor. But you know, a young gal and a young man, they meet. After a time of interest and in meeting together, the couple looks and says, well, let's uh, continue this. This is fun. It feels good. Did you ever feel that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Now, at, at that time, the other prospects out there, guys and girls, begin to fade away from our vision. Right? Okay. You know, it's been a long time, and I not too sure, can't remember real well. But after all this type of thing, they meet, and they go here, they go up to... So they got the farmland, they climbed mountains together as their relationship continues to grow and grow. They say, you know, this is pretty good stuff. I like this. And somehow our mind becomes always occupied with that other person. They sort of come front and center in our mind. And they become engaged. And then, things get really serious. They make sure there's no other gal or guy, depending on male or female, in their lives. Engagement means, means commitment. And so that begins a process where turning fully away from other guys and gals around them, they head toward marriage. Talking things over, exploring what they, she likes and what I like, maybe our interests, our habits, what are, what are we alike, what are, how are we different. Then the time comes when marriage is the natural outcome of a full relationship with that other person. And it's a natural thing. You grow to it. They fully commit themselves, finally, in marriage. What's the one phrase? And some people have taken it out these days. You remember? Peter, do you remember? What's the final phrase in that uh, marriage commitment? I do. <laughs> I think before that we hear the, ter the phrase, Peter, I prompted you, now why... Uh, <laughs> a very important part of the thing is what? Till death do us part. Right? Why? What, what does that mean? I'm promising Gail that during my life I am totally her. Not somebody else's. I'm her. And that 
after they say, I do, we say they have become one. Right? One before God. So, you know, when it comes to being born again, or engaged, as we said, we spend time together with Jesus. He teaches us more and more about him. And most of all, he teaches us a whole lot about ourselves. We grow closer together. We fully commit ourselves to Jesus without holding nothing from him. Will, willfully saying to Jesus, take me, I am yours. One phrase, that, one place where that example really doesn't work is that phrase, till death do us part. The difference in this relationship, there is no death. There is no parting with Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, in the Bible, this is stated as marrying, marrying the bridegroom of life, or Jesus Christ, our Lord. Processes taking place resemble sort of the man and wife and sort of resemble the processes that take place as we grow towards Christ. Lead up to our full commitment to him saying we are one. He says we are now one together. Engagement is great. That was fun. Did you have fun? Ravina, did you have fun during marriage? Or engagement? But I don't know, I'm sure it's probably true with you all too. Um, but the fun was just beginning for me. When the marriage took place, wow, then it really became fun. Oh, I know you can think of many different things when I talk about fun here. But there was something about that marriage. The fun of being together, the fun of having it as part of your life. The fun of being owned by someone else. A great feeling. And that's our experience with Jesus Christ. It is great. And now we are his. In June, I'm going back to America. And I probably said this before, but my wife won't let me forget it. I'm going to have a, our, our 50th wedding anniversary. Oh, Shimyang. <laughs> I don't know. She must be much older than me. I, I don't know. Uh, 50, 50 years. Now, you may or may not believe this. But you know what I think? It's getting better all the time. After living together all these years, there's so much pleasure. She knows what I'm thinking most of the time. I'm sort of erratic. I know what she's thinking. Our inside spirits, sort of, support each other. And believe me, I know that I'm here and she's there right now. She's not in Korea. This absolute commitment is real. It must be real. In our relationship to Jesus Christ. It has to be there so that we know it, and we sense it, and to trust him fully, more than we can trust our mates here on this life, in this life. I wonder if some of you aren't thinking, why are you talking about this again? You talked about this last Sunday. Well, we can't really talk about love, God's love, and our love that we're given for each other 
has to come from a fully committed heart to God. We have to have our sins forgiven. And our hearts have to be fully owned by God. I know of no simpler way of saying it. We are His. We must recognize Him as our owner. We are, as biblically is spoken about, we are in a sense His love slave. Love then is simply the response of our heart after we were filled with the Holy Spirit in our lives and fully His. He puts His love in us for others. And then we become able to love in situations where there is no love. As the scripture tells us, loving others who do not love us, turning the other cheek to those who constantly cause us trouble. Folks, I don't know about you, but these descriptions of Jesus and about his people walking the second mile. If somebody wants your pants, give them your coat. I do not find those natural. That is not my natural inside. But because of Christ, he enables me to love. When my Real bills, so to speak, or false bills, now that I'm his. He enables me to love. Love like this is not natural. But that's the love that reflects out of us the presence of God in our lives. And that's the love that people see. Last week, John talked about two kinds of people in this world. Those who live righteously and those under the control of Satan in this world. These two types of people can be distinguished by those, same way by those who one, love one another and two, those who do not. This is the greatest test of our Ownership by God. How we love. Love and hate provide a very, very simple test of righteousness and unrighteousness in this world. The supreme example of our Lord is Jesus Christ, who gave of himself to, to others. Today's exa example in John 1 tells us that in the very beginning, Abel was righteous. And therefore, his sacrifice was accepted by God. Cain was evil and killed his righteous brother. His sacrifice was not accepted by God, even though God had warned him. You see, love and hate clearly show others what's in, in our hearts. This love cannot be hidden from others nor can hate or lack of love be hidden. It's easily seen. Love brings life. Hate brings death. Love blossoms in those times when there's no fertilizer, there's no water, but somehow from inside, like a springing well of water, love is there. Each of us reflect two masters. This early story of Cain and Abel tells us that the world is not pleased with the agape love. But yet I hear, hear so many times complaining, born again persons complaining or acting very surprised about the world 
around us hating us or mistreating us. The world is evil. And therefore, hates the one who represents the good. Each of us do reflect two masters. The righteous reflect Jesus Christ, whom we have given ourselves to serve. The unrighteous reflects Satan, the evil one, who has controlled man and his culture surrounding him from the very fall in the garden. To love is to abide in life. To hate is to abide in death. Then Christ is life. Then Cain is death. Love of the brother is the test, the absolute proof of being in Christ. The greatest love that man can know is the love of Jesus Christ on the cross. <clears throat> Jesus said there was no greater love than to lay down his life for a friend. <clears throat> One can almost conceive of doing that for your friend. But like Jesus, to lay down his life for the same ones who were jeering him and beating him. Those around him who hated him. But to lay down his life is love supreme. Is love divine. Man cannot understand this love. But this agape love through the power of the Holy Spirit is the model for you and me in this world. Jesus gave us countless examples of, and stories of how to love. Others first at all times Others first at all times is the main pillar, the main supporting pillar of this agape love. It is loving our enemies. It is the missionary, the layman, the Bible translators who love others in such a way that their emotions are stirred around them. In return, this person who is loved must either love in return or develop a immense dislike for that person who portrays in his life and actions this selfless type of love. You know, we Americans, we demand our rights. This is my right. I have every right to do this. See, once we put it in rights, we back out of whether it should be in love or not. We Americans do that. We Koreans demand that we be allowed to protect our face. Amen. No deep question about love. We must protect our faith. Is that the love of the cross? We Papua New Guineans absolutely demand the right of revenge. If there's an accident or something small, it doesn't matter. The whole tribe will mobilize itself against the other tribe and that individual. They'll seek to kill. And if you're of that tribe, you can be in very difficult waters if you're a Christian. Because the sinful culture around us, Americans and Koreans and Papua New Guineans, is not righteous. None of these cultures represent kind of love, God's love and grace to the world around us. This love we are to live moment by moment, discount saving faith, saving, pushing rights, taking revenge, 
discounts those as representing death and evil in sin. Love is not just saying so, it is doing acts of love to one another. Now, some of our thinkers among us, and who knows who they are, are probably wondering, well, how is this possible? Can I answer you honestly this morning? Grammatically, we would say it isn't. Common language, we would say it ain't. This kind of love has to come from a heart that is absolutely, fully, without reservation, under control of Jesus Christ. It cannot come from a heart that's under self-control. And sort of ruled by those around us and our own passions. It is important for us to realize a very important point, important point about God-given love. As true lovers of God, and listen closely, John the Apostle brought this up so well. We must not only love God, our friends, other Christians, but we must love others who have been created in the likeness of God. What does that mean? Well, we got to love everybody, is a simple answer. And it's because there is a likeness of God in others that he fills us with this agape-type love. A divine love from the Holy Spirit that enables us. We cannot do it on ourselves. It is impossible. It's only possible through the love of God. If we fail to love God's likeness in you and you and you and you and me, we are actually, by John's definition, sinning against others by preventing them to coming to Christ. All of us share a very poor human habit as mankind. We talk a lot about loving. And you know, it's easy to love with the right people at the right time. It's easy. But when we talk about this love, that you and I are a part of if we are totally owned by the Holy Spirit, it's now time to act. Let's have it said about us, our K and New Church, like the early church. Remember what they said about that? My, how they love one another. Not through their own power, but through the power of God. Being born again is not to sin. Being born again is to love our brother. <clears throat> Let's pray about it, shall we? Let's bring ourselves, all of us, into a right relationship with God. Let's seal the marriage contract. And simply put, let's practice what we preach. Let's practice what we say. Let's practice what we really believe. Let's do it. Amen? Amen. Thank you.